So I'd like to welcome all of you. Uh, it's awesome to see everybody in here. It looks like we have 182 attendees, which is phenomenal. I'm, I'm really, that, that tells me that uh, we got a lot of uh, InDesign users. Uh, some of you are probably attempting to make accessible PDF documents. Some of you probably already are. And uh, maybe those that are, are running into a couple of uh, hangups, um, you know, in the process. So uh, what I'm hoping to do is walk you through some of the key things um, that we need to do in Adobe InDesign. I have provided everybody with a handout, which is an article that I wrote uh, for InDesign Magazine on making um, InDesign documents accessible. And hopefully that'll be a good resource for everybody to... Um, to look back on and, and follow up. Um, I'm going to do my best to monitor the chat. Um, uh, it's kind of hard to show and, and monitor at the same time, but um, I, I will definitely do my best. So I'm going to go ahead and dive right in here. Um, but before I dive into InDesign, what I wanted to do is I, I find a lot of times when I start talking about making a document accessible, we, we go through the steps, we go through the motions because that's what I'm telling you to do, right? But I find that a lot of times we don't really understand the why behind it. So I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I am going to start by showing you um, an existing PDF file. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And I'm going to share this one. Okay, so hopefully everybody is seeing my business proposal. And what I'm also hoping. Number lock off. Are you guys hearing that voicing? Could, could somebody just. Marquee maybe... Zoom. Number lock off. Yes, we can hear that chat. Thank you so much. So. Number lock off. Number what lock I've done, off quiet. Uh, what I've done is I've opened up a PDF document in Acrobat and I've launched NVDA, which is a very popular screen reader. Um, you could use JAWS as well. But what I wanted to show you is um, a, as, as a cited user, when I read a document such as a newspaper or a, a magazine article, one of the first things I do is I scan the headlines. I think most of you would agree that you probably do the same thing. And one of the things that we do as people who are making documents accessible is we need to impart that same heading structure into the document. And the reason for that is because using a screen reader, I can tap the H key on my keyboard. Business proposal heading level one and it'll read the first heading. If I press the H key again, EchoFlow Systems Incorporated, heading level two. It'll read the next heading, and so on and so forth. Let me jump per ahead a page few. Page four about us, heading level one. Page five, who we are, heading level two. What we do, heading level two. Okay, and then if I wanna continue reading from this point, I can read the next paragraph. List with six items H. Our e-commerce me expanded chief focused population exceptional not share all. Now, this text is lorem epsom, so some of it doesn't make sense. But uh, you, you guys hopefully are understanding, you know, why it's important for us to add the heading structure. And I'm going to show you one more thing. If I press the T key. Table with six rows and three columns, row one, column one, page 11. And now NVDA froze. So I'm going to stop what I'm doing here and I'm going to switch over to my other um, screen. And now you guys should be seeing my, my InDesign uh, document. So when we talk about, um, you know, of all the applications that allow us to create accessible PDF files. Table that, unknown. That's Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, uh, Adobe InDesign. I have to say InDesign is the best, right? Of all the programs that, that we have to use, InDesign does the best job. Now, what makes InDesign a bit challenging, however, is that when we talk about 
maintaining the correct order of content in a document. InDesign is a bit challenging only because unlike Microsoft Word, unlike Microsoft Word, um, Adobe InDesign allows you to position things wherever you want, right? There's no limitation. And that's huge for us as designers. But uh, when it comes to making sure things are read in the correct order, it could create some challenges. So what I wanted to talk to you about is InDesign documents that kind of naturally flow from one page to the other, the order is very easily established because that flow order is going to be your tag order, which is also going to be your reading order. So it just kind of makes things super easy. Tag order is critical for uh, JAWS and NVDA because tag order is the order that those assistive technologies use as the order to read the content in the document. All right. So that's, that's really, really important. Now, when your document is not flowing, so my document, for example, you can see I've got a frame up here, I've got a frame down here, a frame over here. The order is a little bit more tricky because without any intervention on your part, InDesign is going to start in the upper left corner, go across, and then down. So, you know, think of a, a magazine cover. For example, you know, the, the order that you want the content to be read may not equate to the position of the object on the page, right? So that's something we, we need to keep in mind. So, so that's one of the first things. Just look at your document, look at how it's, you know, utilized. If it's flowing, probably not much you have to do. If it's not flowing, we're going to have to leverage something called the articles panel. And I'll cover that in a little bit. Now, the other thing I encourage you to do at the very beginning of the process, right, before we even think about creating a PDF, is evaluate your color contrast. We as designers tend to be really good at this. However, there are also times, and I see it, where we incorporate colors into our file that either A, do not have sufficient contrast, or, or B may not be good color combinations for users who are, are colorblind or low vision. So how do we evaluate color contrast? Well, one of the easiest ways we can do this is uh, using a free tool that you can download. If you just do a, a Google for color contrast analyzer, um, I have that application installed. It's a free application. And what it allows me to do is up here at the top, I can pick my foreground color and I can pick the background color. So if I use the eyedropper here and I say, okay, this is my foreground color. And then I use the eyedropper here and I say, this is my background color. If you look down here, you can see that at the WCAG AA level, which is the, the level that most organizations are striving for, AAA, is is in some ways unattainable. Um, it, it is in fact a standard, but it's really not um, not doable uh, at, at a, in a, a lot of components. So at the AA level, you can see that that color contrast passes for both regular text and large text. So that's good. And so we might go through our document and look at any other color combinations, such as here. If I can get my keyboard shortcuts to work. Um, I don't know why my short, there we go. Um, and if I pick uh, this color and then I pick the gray as the background color, once again, you can see that they pass at both levels. So it, it's a very manual process. It's not something that you can really run through. Uh, well, well, it's not entirely true that the PAC 2021 checker um, does check your color contrast. So it will go through your document. There are some limitations, and I actually wrote a blog post on those limitations. Um, if you guys check out the Able Docs blog, 
there's a, a post in there that I talked about the PAC 2021 checker and some of the ways that it, it fails, you know, and, and it's because of some of the InDesign features that we use. So check that out if you want to. So once you've established your color contrast, and again, it's important that you do this at this point, because the worst time to check your color contrast is after the PDF has been generated, because at that point, the cake is baked. I can't really edit the colors in the PDF file. I know some of you may argue that with me, but even if I can do it, it's not very fun, right? It's a lot easier to do in InDesign. Now, from here, let's talk about making our document accessible. I like to talk about the low-hanging fruits. Every PDF file that we create needs to have a document title. So the way in which we add a document title to our file is by coming up here to our file menu and choosing file info. And in the file information dialog box, this is where you can see we can add a document title, right? So I'm going to call this the, um, I'll give you guys the credit here, uh, Tech Access Oklahoma. Hopefully I didn't misspell that <laughs> business proposal. Um, now that the title is the only required piece of metadata. Okay. So for accessibility, the title is required. What I like to tell people, the other information in this dialog box, such as the author, I'll go ahead and put my name in here. Um, the description, the keywords, even the copyright not required for accessibility. But if you remember, the reason we're making this accessible is because we're, we're going to be posting it online. These other metadata fields will only help with search engine optimization. It'll help your document be found if somebody is looking for it online. So um, feel free to fill out those other metadata fields, and but just make sure that your document has a title. And a little tip, if you're building an InDesign template, Right, so you're you're kind of incorporating the accessibility into this document, so that when people build a new document from this template, um, the accessibility components are implemented. I always tell people leave the title field blank because I'd rather you get an error that your title is missing than the document have an old title that doesn't make sense for the document. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click OK. I see I've got a bunch of chats in here. I'm just going to check them real quick. Um, okay, great. Uh, that's just kind of like, uh, you know, about the session. No big deal. So um, title field, very important. And then on the flip side, where that title is going to get implemented is when I export this document to a PDF. Um in the advanced category of the export dialog box, um, there is going to be, let me just uh, spit this out. In the advanced category here, this is where you can tell the title to be displayed, okay? By default, it's gonna, it's gonna have the file name. We want it to display the title. That's a, a really common, uh, issue people run into where they'll add a title, but they'll make the PDF and the title fails. And it's because, yes, you have a title, but you didn't tell the title to be displayed. And then, of course, here you can also define the language of your document. I know a lot of companies that I do work for up in Canada, they're often creating a French version. Here in the US, we're often creating a Spanish version. Um, so that's where you can define the language of your document. Excellent. Now, the next component, which is really, really critical with our document, is the use of paragraph styles. Paragraph styles, you guys are all designers, so you know. Paragraph styles are just critical in making sure that my content is formatted consistently throughout my document. So down here, for example, um, I have this text called business proposal. I'm going to apply the main heading to that to format it accordingly. And then uh, if I like come up to some of these other pages here, I have a couple other subheads. If I apply subhead to there, it's going to format those subheads 
the way that I intend them to look. So that's the, that's the, the principal reason for the use of styles. But when it comes to accessibility, okay, the reason why paragraph styles are so important is because that's how we associate the appropriate tag to that style. So there is a WCAG success criteria that you can look up called info and relationships. I think it's 1.4.1, but I always mess up that number. So the, the su success criteria is info and relationships. And info and relationships basically is saying that, you know, we're trying to convey the same information to a user of assistive technology as a sighted user has. So when I'm looking at this document and I see this, this big text that is very important, I need to convey that same level of importance to a user of assistive technology. And the way in which we do that is by associating a tag with that paragraph style. So this text here is using my main heading. If I right click on main heading and choose edit, I can come down here to export tagging. And right down here, I have the ability to associate a tag in the PDF. Now, every style you create in InDesign by default is using automatic. And for the most part, that's always going to map to a P tag. The exception is if you're using a bulleted or numbered list formatting, that will map to a list when automatic is chosen. In the case of my main heading, I want to map that to a H1 tag. And uh, maybe I can clear up some confusion for everybody. Just never use the H tag. Um, a, a lot of people look at it and they're like, well, H must be even more important than an H1. Uh, the reality is that all current assistive technologies ignore the H tag and just read it as a P. Um, I'm not going to bore you guys with the details on that. Technically, the H tag is a thing in the PDF UA specifications, but no assistive technology honors it at this point. So for now, just ignore it. So I'll make that an H1, click OK. And now this text in the PDF file is going to be mapped to an H1 tag. So, uh, you know, H1 is the most important heading in your document, right? And then if I go to say subhead and I edit that, that is still an important heading, but not as important as the main heading. So I'm going to map that to an H2. So you just want to incorporate a logical structure into your document. Now, I will tell you as a designer, and I see this all the time, we as designers love to randomly use headings at random locations in a document. <laughs> I know you're, I know you're out there. You're, you all do it. And so the problem with that is your heading structure in a PDF needs to go in sequence, right? So uh, your first heading always has to be an H1. The next heading has to be an H2. If you go H1 to H3, error, right? Because you're skipping a heading level. So when, when you guys use a heading at a random location because you think it just looks good there, it's going to create a problem because you're going to skip heading levels. So what you're going to find is you do more and more of this, you're going to start thinking about your headings and subheads hierarchically. Instead of just visually, you're going to start thinking about them hierarchically. And that is going to help you to avoid that problem. And you're going to want to make sure that when you use your headings, that you're using them in the proper sequence. Uh, Give me one second. I got some Q and A's here. Um, oh yeah, Sand Sandra, that's a great question. Is there a reason I do not let it auto tag? There is a reason. It's because auto tag stinks. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Acrobat has an auto tag feature. InDesign does not, but Acrobat has an auto tag feature, and there are a chosen few things that auto tag does well, but most things it does really poorly. Um, your headings are always going to be out of order. They're never going to be correct. Um, so my recommendation is avoid auto tag at all costs. Um, and then, uh, somebody said, what's the best way to do an accessibility audit on PDFs available for download on a site? How does 
this affect things like PDFs that are gated. Gated. I'm sorry, Ashley. I don't know what gated means. Um, so, uh, so I, I could tell you, I mean, my company, AbleDocs, we have a product called AD Scan that can scan your website and check all of the PDFs on your website for compliance. Um, another great tool is the PAC 2021 checker. That'll check your PDFs for WCAG and PDF UA compliance. Um, and Ashley also says, if you make a PDF in Canva, how can you make them accessible? Uh, the answer, Ashley, is you can do it, but it's, it's the hard way, it's the time-consuming way, and it's the expensive way because Canva does not create a tagged PDF. So your only option is to make the PDF and manually tag it in Acrobat um, after the fact. Um, oh, gated being they have to fill out a form to get the PDF. How does this affect things like, I mean, um, PDFs can be made fillable, not a problem, especially in InDesign. InDesign is my preferred way of making a fillable PDF form. And those PDF forms can be made accessible. If you do them in InDesign, InDesign will automatically tag the form fields. And if you build it correctly, it'll nest them properly in the tag structure. Um, Kelsey says, do you suggest setting heading level looks, i.e. font size, color, et cetera, before creating the document to stay consistent or Zodicate to have different looks? Oh yeah, Kelsey, you can have, it's totally fine to have like a subhead, a subhead blue, a subhead red, a subhead green, and all of those subheads mapping to H2. That's totally fine. I think that's what you're asking there. Um, but I always recommend like, just like you go through the design process and you create your headings. Um, all I'm saying is you want to start to thinking about those headings hierarchically. Um, but the correlation between the hierarchy and the visual look is pretty much the same, right? Main heading, subhead, sub subhead, heading one, heading two, heading three, right? Um, oh yeah. And uh, yeah, not a problem. So that would be the PAC 2021 checker. And you can find that at PDF. Hold on. I think it's pdfua.foundation. Don't quote me on that. I think I got it right. Um, I really should know that. Um, and I did reply to that, but I don't see it. Um, I just popped the link in the chat for that, Chad. Okay. Thank you so much. Lisa, is InDesign only for Apple products? Absolutely not. InDesign is available for Mac and Windows. Um, you know, probably your biggest challenge is going to be just learning the product. InDesign is a really, really powerful product. You know, I always say like, uh, if Word is a Pinto, InDesign is a Ferrari. And that's not to put down Word or anything, because Word is a powerful tool for creating accessible PDFs, but InDesign just gives you so much control. So you're going to certainly look at, at getting some training on that. Um, and Betsy asks, if you say an H2, then several H3s, can you return to an H3? Absolutely, Betsy. Absolutely. You can always, you can always go H1, 2, 3, go back to 2, go back to 1. Right. But yeah, H123 back to two, H3, H3 back to two. That's totally fine. Cool. All right. Now, um, so, so that's, that's the importance of paragraph styles and the correlation to your heading structure. Now, the next thing um, that's really important is to make sure that your order is correct. Now, if your content is flowing, right, it, it's very intuitive, it's super simple. If it's not flowing, you need to leverage something called the articles panel. And if you come up here to the windows menu, the window menu in InDesign and choose articles, it's going to open up your article panel. Now, the way this works, I'm going to grab the first thing I want to appear in my document and I'm going to drag it and drop it onto the articles panel. InDesign is going to want to make a new article. You can name that article whatever you want. It's not going to be read by assistive technology. 
I usually let it set to article one. And you can now see that I have one thing in my article. Here's a tricky thing about the articles panel. It's an all or nothing proposition, meaning um, if you're going to use the articles panel, everything you want tagged in your document needs to be added to the articles panel. So right now, if I export this PDF, I'm going to have a couple tags only for this frame. So uh, next, I would grab this guy, drag it. Notice I'm, I'm getting the line there because I want to add it to the existing article. I don't want to create a new article. If I just drop it here, it's going to want to make a new article. So I need to make sure that I put it right underneath there. Now, what I've done is I've created a custom keyboard shortcut in InDesign so I can select this object. And if I use a keyboard shortcut, it'll add it to my articles panel. So that allows me to come in here and like super quick, super fast, add this stuff to my articles panel. Um, I'm not going to do everything because I don't want to bore the heck out of you guys, but you can see that using a keyboard shortcut really helps to make quick work of this process. I'm just going through my document, everything that I want included. I'm just go going ahead and adding that um, to my, to my articles panel. There we go. So, so this, this is how the articles panel works. And so now the order of these objects is the order that everything is going to export when I make my PDF. Now, another little trick. When you use the articles panel, you've got to come up here to the panel menu in the articles panel and make sure you turn on use for tagging order in tagged PDF. If you forget to do that, notice there's now a check mark next to it. But if you forget to do that, it's as if you never used the articles panel at all. InDesign is going to ignore everything you did um, in, in the articles panel. All right. So, that, that is the key in InDesign in how to control the order of objects in your document. Now, um, I want to talk about a couple of other things. Uh, you know, we as designers, right, we're always using imagery in, my, in our document. Those images, okay, on this page, we have a bunch of headshots. Those images fundamentally have no value. Right. The only thing a screen reader knows about them is that it's a graphic. It's going to voice it as a graphic, but that's it. And as you might be thinking, that's really a bad experience for somebody who's using a screen reader. So whenever we use imagery in our, our document, we need to decide two things. One, is the image valuable? Okay. So let me, um, let me come down here a little bit. Uh, so this is a great example, right? This image of these buildings, it's, it, it's interesting. It's visually aesthetic, but does it really relate to my content? And if I describe um, this, this image, is it going to add any value to the document? And, and we're designers. You know, we often use imagery strictly for aesthetic reasons. And when you do that, when you use an image that is strictly a pretty picture, for lack of a better term, you may choose to artifact that image. And, and the term artifact, also called backgrounding, but, but an artifact is a way of saying, don't read this image, right? So, and, and I, I think I could argue that this image really doesn't inherently have much value. If I describe three buildings, um, you know, viewed from below, I, I don't know if that's going to help anybody in, in the overall context of, of our document. So, um, so if you choose that you don't want this to be read, what we could do is we could select that frame. We could come up here to the object menu and choose object export options. And you'll notice here in the tagged PDF button right up the top, I have in the apply tag menu 
the default is from structure, I chose artifact because that image has no value. And by doing that, when I export my PDF, it is not going to export um, at all. It's basically, you know, the 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 PDF is not going to read um, that that figure. Okay. Now, for images that do have importance, right? So, like these images here, um, what we need to do is we need to write alternative text for those images. And alternative text seems like it would be a really simple thing to do. I will tell you, it's probably one of the hardest things for people to do, right? And, and the reason is because like when I do training on this topic, people want me to give them the answer. But to be fair, I'm the worst person in the world to write the alternate text for the photos in your product. Only you know your product. And so my, my biggest uh, piece of advice that I can give you when you're, when you're trying to figure out how do I write alternate text, and by the way, we as designers, we shouldn't be the ones writing the alternate text. That should be the job of the editor, the author, content creators, that, that should really be their job. They're better suited to do that than, than you and I as designers are. Um, but um, to add the alternate text, uh, you want to go to the object menu, choose object export options. And, and I apologize, I, I stopped short. My best piece of advice to you when you're trying to figure out how to write alternate text is ask the question, what is the intent of the image? And if you ask that question and you answer that question appropriately, you're going to be able to write appropriate alternate text for that image. And so in the object export options dialog box, if I click on alt text, you can see that I wrote this text for this image, uh, Mr. Inigo Montoya smiling for a photograph wearing a business suit and tie, right? I mean, that, that's pretty much all I can say about that image. Um, you know, then you can move on to the next one. Now, now this one, I did not add alternate text. Now there's two ways you can add alternate text. One way is in the alternate text source, choose custom, and then type in here, whatever you want the image to say. InDesign gives us a really cool and amazing feature. And that is I can extract information from a metadata field of that image and use it for alternate text. So if I click on the alt text source drop down menu and I choose XMP description, you're going to notice that the alternate text gets sucked into here automatically because somebody wrote the alternate text in the metadata field of that image. It's a really, really efficient way to work in InDesign and to avoid the designer having to A, write the alternate text, B, copy the alternate text from an email and paste it into InDesign. Instead, if you can just give your, your content creators, you know, your writer or author, a copy of Adobe Bridge, have them go into the image and write the alternate text. I think it did the same thing for this image too. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm using the XMP description um, for that as well. So you guys can see um, it, it's a it's a great feature in InDesign and a great way to to leverage that to you know to to get your alternate text for your image. Let me take a quick look at the Q and A guys. Um, Susan, I, I would say yes. Yes. I, I mean, you know, the article goes into a, a, you know, probably a little bit more detail than basic, but it, it's kind of like a, a 10 key steps to follow for, you, you know, for creating accessible PDFs. Um, Sandra says, can you select all and add at one time? I think you're talking about the articles panel. The answer is yes, Sandra. The, the, the problem is that the order in which the items are added, I think are based on the stacking order in the layers panel. So you can add them all at once, but you really still need to go through that articles panel and double check the order. And that's kind of why I don't do that. I'd rather just kind of 
implicitly say, this is the order I want things to be read and not have to kind of go back and, and double check everything. Um, yeah, Zachary, this, this stinks. Um, currently PAC 2021 is windows only. Although the, the, the good news for you is they are working on a Mac version. I, I know that for a fact, but it's not released yet. So I trust me, I'm a Mac user myself and I'm as anxious as you are to get my hands on the Mac version because I run parallels on my Mac so that I can run the pack, uh, 2021 checker. Um, but you know, that's currently the only way, uh, we can do it. All right. Um, and, and is there one for Chrome Jana? I mean, there you're going to find, um, you know, I, I would say that the two strongest checkers out there right now is the Common Look Validator, which is Windows only, and the uh, PAC 2021 checker, which is also currently Windows only. The, the only thing good, you know, the, the, the good thing I could say about PAC 2021 is they are working on a Mac version. I do not think Common Look is working on a Mac version. I, I don't think they care. Um, but, but I could be wrong. I, I don't know that for, for a fact, but I think we as designers tend to be a lot more Mac based, but in the business world, everybody's running windows. So I think that's why a lot of these companies focus their product on the windows side. All right, cool. I think I got everybody. Um, oh, hold on. Ah, yeah. Okay. I'm getting there, Melissa. I'm getting there. Okay, cool. So um, moving on. Now, I, I had mentioned about artifacting objects. The other thing I wanted to bring up on in this document, um, I'm going to actually display my master page because I want to show you that um, I put all of these items that you see here on the master page. And the way that InDesign works is that, I apologize, I forgot to turn on do not disturb, um, is that anything you put on the master page gets artifacted, okay? So all of these items here, all of these things down here, they are automatically going to get artifacted. Now, the, the, the little warning I have for you, and, and one of the problems a lot of people run into, is they will put items on a master page, but on that master page is a URL. And they make, they apply a hyperlink to that URL. That causes a problem. The reason is because the link, because the content is artifacted, the link has nothing to attach itself to. And you then get an error when you, when you check the document because that link is, I say it's, flo it's floating in purgatory. It, it's just that the, the link is just like in the middle of nowhere. It has nothing to connect itself to. And so then you get an error. So my recommendation is, is if you have a URL on the master page, don't apply a hyperlink to it. Um, or if you do, you, you can override that hyperlink on the document page, but you, you're still kind of asking for trouble because you'll likely get an error at some point in your document if you don't override it everywhere that it exists on a, on a document page. So we had a question about tables. Let's move down to tables, which is honestly my, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so, um, so a, a, a table, um, in InDesign, of course, um, I inserted a table. You can see that this, this is in fact a table. Uh, you create a table by going to your table menu and choosing insert table. Um, one of the requirements for tables for accessibility is that every table has to have a header row. 
And if it doesn't, it's going to fail. Um, a lot of times you can ask a question, like if your, if your table doesn't have a header row, it probably should not be a table at all. Okay. So, um, sometimes we, as designers, we like to use tables to like line things up, right? Like maybe you had like five graphics that you wanted evenly spaced across a, 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 a distance and you're like, oh, I'll just create a five column table and put one graphic in each in each cell. That that is going to fail every day of the week. Um, so in, in situations like that, um, it, you probably should not put it in a table. If you do, the only way to make it correct is to fix it in the PDF after you export it. So. Um, I'm a huge proponent is in doing as much as I can in the source document. I don't want to be editing the PDF. I, I kind of, I try to avoid that at all costs. So, um, in, in a lot of cases, I, I, I always avoid using a table, uh, just for alignment purposes. We refer to that as a layout table. Um, but in the case of this table, um, I do have a row up here at the top which is a header row. And what I'm going to do to make that a header row, I'm going to highlight the row and I'm going to go to the table menu and I'm going to choose convert rows to header. Now, when I did that, the formatting changed and that's because I have a table style applied to this table. And so once I made it a header row, the table style made it blue, it made the text white and it formatted it the way that I defined the table style. Um, this column over here is also a header row. However, InDesign natively cannot do that. We don't have a row header feature in InDesign. So for this table, like a, a table that is structured this way, the only way that I could truly make this a header row is to do it in the PDF after I, after I export the PDF. Um, your other option, and, and I'm not really, I don't really have time to talk about this too much, but another really, really powerful option for InDesign is there's a product called Made to Tag. And Made to Tag is a plugin for InDesign that essentially overcomes 95% of the limitations that exist in InDesign for accessibility. So um, if you do a lot of InDesign work, I, I would highly recommend checking out Made to Tag. But, um, but by me making this a header row, this table will pass because this table now has a header row up here. And then all of these are data cells for that row, for that header row. Now, I, I purposefully put a table in here at the very end, which is, oops. Let me try that again. There we go. Um, right here. This is a great example of a layout table. This is a table. There's only three cells in the table. And I really just used it to space out this information accordingly. And the problem here is that I don't have a header row. So the table's going to fail. And the only way for me to really fix this, at least, and, and leave it the way it is, is when the PDF is created, I can move the paragraph tags out of the table and delete the table altogether. Okay. So, um, so that's how we, we manage tables inside of InDesign. Um, another important thing that I just want to point out here, uh, and I'm going to use this as a example, no pun intended here, but we have a URL down here. Now, a lot of you may be aware that uh, implicit URLs, and by that, I mean URLs that are spelled out. So uh, www.apple.com or www.adobe.com. Implicit URLs in, a, in Adobe Acrobat, they're auto-detected as a hyperlink and they are clickable to a sighted user. 
those links, however, are not accessible. And that's a big problem because there's no way for a user of assistive technology to follow that hyperlink. Okay. So uh, also very important, highlight your, your hyperlink, open your hyperlinks panel and click on the create new hyperlink button at the bottom here and enter an appropriate URL. Um, another little tip, whenever I'm creating a, a hyperlink, I always uncheck shared hyperlink destination. Uh, the, the only time I leave it turned on is if I'm using a URL that the same URL in multiple locations of the document. It's the only time I leave that turned on. Uh, and, the, and the reason being is because I've had problems occur because you have a lot of hyperlinks. The shared hyperlinks start overwriting each other. And then your hyperlink, it, it just gets all wonky. So my recommendation is turn that off when you're making your hyperlink. Okay. Awesome. So um, here's another example that I like to show people. And I left this in here on purpose. Um, this was built as a table. And this table violates another WCAG principle, which is using color alone to define meaning, right? And, and this table has multiple problems. The first of which is there's no legend telling me what these colors mean. But to a, to a user of assistive technology, this color is it has no meaning. All we have here is empty cells. So when a user is reading that table, all they're going to do is navigate to an empty cell. They have no idea that the cell is blue or that the cell is a certain color and that that color has a specific meaning. So, so I left this in here as an example of what not to do, <laughs> you know, in your document, don't, you know, and, and we, we as designers, um, you want to start to think about this when you do bar charts and line graphs and things like that, because we often do use color alone to signify meaning like uh, Mary's sales are in red and John's sales are in blue. That's a really bad accessibility violation because there's no way for the user to interpret that information. So keep that in mind as you're, you know, moving forward as you're building and, and laying out your documents. Guys, um, let's see. Do we have any, any questions I can answer? Um, Uh, Veneta, you cannot create a fillable PDF form from Word. Um, you can create the form in Word, make the PDF, add the form fields in the PDF, but you can't actually create form fields in Word that will carry over to the PDF. So unfortunately, no, there, there's no good answer. Uh, James says when you're adding a hyperlink, there's a button for, oh, Thank you, James. And, and I, I apologize significantly for that. Um, and James is right. When I create a hyperlink, there is an accessibility button down here that gives you the ability to write appropriate alternate text for that hyperlink. And that is a requirement of PDF UA. That requirement stems from a point in time when it was very common for us to, to have a hyperlink that said, click here, right? And I think a lot of you probably already know this, right? That that's a really bad thing to do because where am I going? I have no idea where this link is gonna take me. So in a case like that, you could add alt text to the hyperlink that says, uh, um, go to the Tech Access Oklahoma homepage to download this handout, 
right? Yes. So thank you for reminding me of that, James. I'm a lot of moving parts in this, in this presentation. Um, Steven, InDesign costs $32 a month, I believe is the cost. Um, InDesign, which is part of Creative Cloud, is subscription-based. So although I will tell you, you can subscribe for one month at a time, although it's a little more expensive if you do it that way. But fundamentally, InDesign is like 32 bucks a month. The entire Creative Cloud, I think, is $55 a month, and that'll give you almost everything. Um, Ashley says, is there, is there an example of the right way to have graphical data? I'm a digital analyst, so data visualization. Alert Dax something. Castro, what? Send button, reply button, close button. Right. Um, so it certainly gets tricky, Ashley. Um, I thought I had, here we go. So I'm assuming, Ashley, maybe you're talking about Alert something Dax like Castro, this. Alert Dax Castro, you saved a bunch of money on car insurance. Send button, reply button, close button. Um, so, you know, a lot of times with like graphs like this. Alert um, first meeting Able Docs one voice internal group Dax Castro started the meeting. Right. Join meetup, text. press control shift J okay, to join you meeting. You have to basically Button describe join meetup. Message press control shift R to or, open or meeting chat. Chart. Button message. Um, Close button. And so like with this graph, right? I mean, what I, you know, again, ask yourself, what is the intent, right? The, the, the intent of this graph is really not to give you specific numbers. The intent of this graph is show, to show a trend over time. So my alt text for this graph, actually, I might have already written it. No, I forgot to. But the alternative text for this graph may say um, actual versus projected sales from 2012 to 2022 showing a steady growth of both actual and projected sales from 2 million to four and a half million over the defined period. 